Well, um, today we have Dr. Peter Goodman, and uh, someone yesterday asked me, well, how did you get Peter Goodman? Like, it was a real feat. And I thought, well, I better fess up. He's one of my best friends. <laughs> and his wife, Ann, who was here a second ago, went to West Hampton College with me, and we've been friends ever since. So it was a pretty easy job. And I'm, I'm real proud of him because he's so smart and he's so funny and vivacious. Um, he, he read about his education. He started at Virginia with undergraduate school. He was an English major. And uh, turned it off. <laughs> and um, he graduated with honors. And um, he loved William Faulkner. Now that's a big deal for most of us who are English majors. He had William Faulkner as a teacher for several classes. So that's an experience in and of itself. And if you know Peter, he will break into Shakespearean quotes over anything. And so he has never left his roots of English at the University of Virginia to a point the car y'all might have seen him driving, riding in. Um, a little convertible. It's not Susie. It's not named Susie or Alice. It's Dulcinea, male or macho. So it lives with him. I think his father, at the time he signed up for being a major in English, wasn't that pleased because uh, you got to you know, have a li living. But Peter knew he was going to med school. He got all the stuff he needed in time so he could go straight into MCB where he uh, went to school and where he did his residency. Then he went on to Sinai for his fellowship, his fellowship, right, Peter? And then Georgetown for another fellowship. Okay, so he's, he's educated. <laughs> Matter of fact, he's probably the most educated person I know. But um, he did use all this education uh, for 39 years uh, as a gastroenterologist, and he um, did something that's very special and probably can't be done again. He decided to head with it. I'm tired of some of the stuff, shenanigans with a, a big practice. I'm going to be a sole practitioner, and he, he enjoyed every second of it. And an example of how funny he can be at dinner the other night with Ann Williams, who also shares them as best of friends, he said, you know, no one in my field or in science will win a Nobel Prize for the cure of hemorrhoids. <laughs> uh, so you have to keep that in mind. And talking about hemorrhoids, as he tells you about the channels of Mars ending and a word I've never used as many times as the last month is the word hemorrhoids. I don't know why I was taught never to mention it. Um, but he said, everybody has them. So with that, let's hear from Peter Goodman. Thank you all. Sally, I, I didn't know who you were talking about. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I told my father, my, my parents came from Belarus, and I told my father that I was going to major in English when I went to UVA. And he said, you're majoring in English. You already know English. Why are you doing majoring? <laughs> so um, the title of my talk is The Canals of Mars and the Gastrointestinal Tract. Uh, can, you, can you hear me in the back? Raise your hand if you have difficulty hearing me. Uh, and if you all could turn off the lights so you could see my dirty pictures better, okay? Yeah, yeah just be sure you talk okay. into it. Um, I want to thank Sally Wood and the Cedarfield Program Committee uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, I consider it a, a special privilege. Uh, I feel also uh, that it's appropriate to thank you, the audience, as it reflects your intellectual curiosity. Uh, and your willingness to open your mind to some new ideas. Uh, and this, in turn, makes you a much more interesting individual. Uh, this morning, we're going to take a voyage 
down the Grand Canal. Uh, the, uh, this is not the Grand Canal of Venice, but the 30-foot long gastrointestinal tract. Uh, we will begin our journey with the mouth and the sense of taste, and we will end appropriately with the rectum and the treatment of hemorrhoids, as uh, Sally is suggesting. Uh, and during our travels, uh, I plan to discuss the various diseases and problems that we will encounter. Now, when one gives a lecture, uh, one, the speaker should have a, a definite uh, objective, a purpose in the talk. Uh, and the purpose of this particular talk is not so much to be entertaining, but to give you a few pearls that you can take home with you. Uh, I would like to think my talk was a success uh, if you have gained some information that you find that is personally useful. And that is my objective. Um, I am a retired gastroenterologist. I, uh, I uh, was a solo practitioner uh, and a dinosaur. Uh, but I was the happiest doctor in the Bon Secours building. Uh, when my patients called me at night, I knew who I was talking to, uh, and uh, they knew who I was, uh, and this made things uh, much, much simpler. Never had a malpractice suit in over 40 years, and part of it is because of my relationship with my patients. Uh, the proof of my happiness in the practice of medicine is the fact that I did not retire till I was in my mid-70s. Uh, as for the title of my talk, uh, I thought that uh, one of the reasons you're here this morning is curiosity. Uh, and let me explain. If I ask you what is the strongest of all human emotions, what would you say? Well, if you said love, you'd be wrong, uh, because almost half the marriages in this country uh, end up in divorce. So it's not love that's the strongest human emotion. Um, Joseph Conrad, in his novel, Heart of Darkness, said curiosity is the strongest human emotion. And I think he is right. Curiosity really is a strong force uh, in our thinking. Uh, you're curious as to what could possibly be the relationship between the canals of Mars and the gastrointestinal tract. Well, let me try to explain. Uh, in November of 2011, the United States launched a rocket to Mars. This $2.4 billion project uh, was an investment for a single purpose, to solve curiosity. Uh, and the name of the rover that was launched by the rocket, the name of the rover was Curiosity. Uh, you're here now because you're curious and you want to learn. And again, that says nice things about you and it makes you more, uh, a more interesting individual. When I was a small boy, uh, people spoke of the possibility of the canals on the surface of the red planet. Uh, this was a real idea. Uh, and in the 19th and the 20th century, uh, there was an accepted possibility. Uh, there were characters like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon who traveled to Mars. Uh, and here are some of the drawings that were done with the idea of the canals on Mars. Uh, in 1971, the Mariner uh, 9 uh, spacecraft took photos of Mars and showed definitively that there were no canals on Mars. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Percival Lowell uh, took pictures of Mars and had created the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, specifically to take pictures 
of the canals of Mars which did not exist. Now, let me give you an example of a completely uh, false idea uh, that ruled the practice of medicine. Um, t uh, some of the ideas that I'm going to present to you today uh, should not be chiseled in stone because some of these ideas that I'm going to present will be proven wrong. The only problem is we don't know which ideas are going to be wrong and which ones are going to be right. But take, take it with a grain of salt, some of the ideas that I give you. Now, let us start appropriately with the mouth and the sense of taste. Uh, in medical school, I was taught that there were four distinct different senses of taste. Uh, sweet, salty, bitter, and sour. This was completely wrong. Uh, there are five senses of taste. The fifth sense is called humani, U-M-A-M-I. And humani is a savory, uh, meaty uh, taste. I was also taught that on the tongue, there are specific areas for salt and bitter and sweet. This was also wrong. Uh, the sense of taste is diffuse on the tongue and in the mouth. Um, it is interesting that we have 25 times as many receptors for bitter than for sweet. Now, we have all spit out something that was too bitter. We never spit out anything that's too sweet. And why is that, you see? Well, Darwin would say that was it done by design. This is to prevent us from eating or drinking something toxic. And in a sense, the, the esophagus is smarter than we are. Uh, it knows when to regurgitate something that's bad. Uh, now, let me start by saying, would you agree, raise your hand if you would agree that the sense of taste is affected by sound? Well, I don't see a single hand raised. Okay, well you're wrong. <laughs> taste is affected by sound. If you eat a potato chip and you have earplugs on, the, uh, you, you don't hear the crunch. And you think that the potato chip is stale, you see? And it doesn't taste as good. Raise your hand if you think that the sense of taste and appetite is affected by color. Well, I've got a few more. Good, good. Well, it has been shown that if you serve food on a red plate, you will put less food on the plate if the plate is red. That is the truth. It's been done. If you have white wine and you put a little drop of food coloring in it, 30, let's say red food coloring, 35% of the people who drink the wine will think it's rosé or red wine. It fools you, you see. Again, the sense of color has a lot to do. And a colorful meal just tastes better than a bland uh, uh, oatmeal type of uh, uh, plate. Now, smell, we all know, has a strong effect on the sense of taste. When we have a bad cold, uh, we can't taste the food as well. And sadly enough, people who have a permanent tracheostomy, where they're breathing through a hole in their trachea, have lost a significant amount of sense of taste. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, would not chew tobacco or smoke because he felt that it would reduce his sense of taste. Now, let's travel down the esophagus and let's talk a little bit about heartburn. And let me show you what heartburn looks like. That is heartburn. Uh, heartburn is a erosion, and here you see these ulcers in the esophagus and the redness. And this is looking down with the endoscope into the stomach, 
and here is the opening of the esophagus going into the stomach. Uh, the esophagus is located behind the heart. And sometimes when you have very bad heartburn, you can actually think it is cardiac pain. And that's how the name heartburn comes, because patients get confused thinking that it's their heart. And the esophagus is an amazing muscle. It's a three-layered muscle. Uh, peanut butter will get stuck to your roof of your mouth, uh, get stuck to your teeth, but peanut butter never gets stuck to your esophagus. Uh, the esophagus propels the food bolus down one way. Uh, but when you drink too much whiskey or you eat something bad, once again the esophagus is smarter than you and you vomit. And it's a reflex where you regurgitate. Uh, when acid reflux is bad, really bad, it tends to scar the esophagus, uh, and food gets stuck and hangs when you swallow it. Um, this gets to be like a little narrowed stricture. Uh, when you're eating and you feel something hanging up, please, please, please do not continue to eat thinking that you will push it down. It doesn't work that way. What I would suggest you do when you feel something hanging up is to drink a little bit of water. And if that is not successful, then excuse yourself, go to the bathroom, and try to regurgitate. That is the best way to get it out of your esophagus. You will not try, you will not succeed in passing it down if there is a stricture. When I see a patient who has a narrowing in the esophagus, what I do is an upper endoscopy. And I look down in the esophagus and I take a small balloon and I blow it up and stretch it open. Can I have a question? What? Come closer to the microphone. So okay. I, I want to make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, what I do is I endoscope the patient, look down the esophagus, and stretch it open uh, so that the narrowing is clear. Uh, let me give you some suggestions to prevent heartburn. One of the problems we have is we always want a quick, simple little answer. And so when we get heartburn, we take Nexium or Primasec or Zantac, uh, but that is a treatment, a, a, a better approach is to try to prevent the heartburn. And let me make some suggestions. If you were going to drive to New York City, you fill the car with gas in Richmond. You don't fill the car with gas when you get to New York. We eat our biggest meal at night and then we lie down. And that is one of the major problems with reflux and heartburn at night. The next thing we do is we put pillows behind our head. What the pillows does is it simply elevates our head and bends our neck and gives us a little arthritis in the neck, but it does not elevate the valve at the end of the esophagus. And here's a picture of the valve wrapping around at the end of the esophagus that prevents heartburn. Uh, the second thing you should do is certain foods we know aggravate and open up this valve here at the end of the esophagus. Coffee is notorious, uh, and it has nothing to do with caffeine. Coffee opens up the valve. Chocolate, which contains caffeine, also opens up the valve. Uh, and try to avoid orange, orange juice also adds to this problem. Uh, so a better approach 
to heartburn rather than simply popping a Nexium pill or a Prilosec pill or a Zantac pill is to try to prevent the problem rather than to treat the problem. Now, we talked about certain foods opening up the valve. Uh, obesity is an added problem. Too many of us belong to the clean plate club. Uh, the meal is over when the plate is clean. Uh, it's almost, uh, our, one of my parents would have told us that there are some starving children in some foreign country and that you're leaving food on your plate. You're going to find that it is very hard to walk away from the dinner table leaving food on your plate. Let's try to do that though. See what, see if you can manage. Uh, Shakespeare was right. Uh, he said, the fault, the Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. We are the problem, and we are the problem that causes the heartburn. Um, now, for every complex problem, there is a clear and simple answer, and it's wrong. <laughs> Surgery is not the answer for heartburn. Uh, the surgeon will tell you that he wants to tighten this valve. Well, if he tightens it too tight, you can't vomit. If he tightens it too tight, you can't belch. If he doesn't tighten it enough, then the problem is not solved and you still have the reflux. So I do not recommend surgery for the problem of heartburn. Uh, perfection is not for this world, and uh, if you strive for it, it's well and good, but you can get into problems. Now, the next step would be, let us get back in our gondola, and we will go into the stomach. Uh, first, let us find out, since we don't have a GPS, where the stomach is. I'd like for you to stand up, and with one finger, point to where the stomach is. Stand up, point to where you think. Now, I'm not telling you to point to your abdomen. I want you to point to this hollow organ that's nine and three quarter inches in size, where it specifically is the stomach. Well, you're all pointing to your abdomen and your belly button, but this is not your stomach. Let me show you where the stomach is. Y'all sit down, you fail. We need you there. The stomach is in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. Left upper quadrant of the abdomen. The stomach is below the diaphragm, which separates the chest from the abdomen, and above the pelvis. And here is the stomach. Now, let me tell you another, well, if I, I just told you that the stomach was nine and three quarter inches in size. From here to here. For extra credit, raise your hand if you know who Joey Chestnut is. <laughs> Two hands up, Joey Chestnut. Joey Chestnut won the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest this year. This is an important fact, and I want you to take that home with you. It's one of the pearls. He ate 75 hot dogs in 12 minutes at the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. Now, I just told you that the stomach is nine and three quarter inches across. How did he do it? You see, he stretched his stomach, and he practiced and practiced and practiced. And he would eat and then vomit, but he stretched his stomach so he could put in, if a hot dog weighs a quarter of a pound, and he ate 75 hot dogs, we're talking about 18 pounds of hot dogs that he ate at this contest. It shows you how, uh, Adaptable, I guess you could say, uh, the stomach is. Uh, now, let me give you another little 
Pearl, raise your hand if you think that ulcers was, are caused by stress, acid, aggravation, and a poor diet. Wrong. Get that out of your head right now. Wrong. I was taught in the 1960s at Georgetown Medical Center that ulcers were caused by stress, acid, aggravation, and a bad diet. Um, that is incorrect. Um, the cardinal rule that I was taught was that if you eliminate the acid, you eliminate the ulcer. No acid, no ulcer. This was the prime directive. And this is how I treated my patients incorrectly in the early 1960s. See. I gave them Maylox and Mylanta. And Maylox and Mylanta, can you hear me? You're doing okay? Good. Maylox and Mylanta had magnesium. And this gave them diarrhea, but I told them, this is what you have to do. I also gave them a diet, a sippy one and a sippy two diet. And this contained milk and cream. And I raised their cholesterol, you see? And that's all that the diet did. And then I advanced their diet to poached eggs and cottage cheese. Uh, and this also raised their cholesterol and did nothing for the diet. And then when the patients did not improve on my regimen, you see, oh, I also gave them Librium and Valium. They liked Librium and Valium. And uh, that was for the stress and the anxiety, you see. And when the patient didn't improve, I questioned closely and I said, did you have a pepperoni, pepperoni pizza? And of course, they cheated a little. And the result was I sent them to the surgeon. And what did the surgeon do? The surgeon followed the dictum, no acid, no ulcer. And so what he did was he cut out half of the stomach so that there was less acid secretion. And he cut the vagus nerve, which stimulates acid secretion in the stomach. It was called the Bill Roth one or a Bill Roth two operation. And this achieved one thing, a good bill from the surgeon. It did absolutely nothing to help heal the ulcer. Um, Barry Marshall was a generalist uh, at a hospital in uh, Australia. Let me see if I have a picture of Barry Marshall. There he is. The generalist. Uh, in, he, was not, he was not a gastroenterologist uh, in Australia. And he worked with a pathologist by the name of Robin Warren. And he uh, said he found a germ in the stomach, Helicobacter pylori. And he said that this germ is causing the ulcer, you see. Well, he sent a letter to the Lancet, which is the premier British medical journal, and the letter was rejected. Uh, he then sent it to the New England Journal of Medicine, and what do you think happened? It was rejected. You see, he showed that there was a correlation between the ulcer in the patient and a germ. But he did not show that the germ caused the ulcer. Let me see if I have a picture of a bleeding ulcer. I've got all these Yes, here, here it is. There's a bleeding ulcer. Bleeding ulcer. So he did not show 
You see, correlation does not mean causation. Once again, correlation does not mean causation. The clock strikes 12, the train comes into the station, the clock did not bring the train in. You know, I would see intelligent people in the office wearing a copper bracelet. And they tell me, I put this bracelet on and in a week, my arthritis got better. What can you say? Correlation does not mean causation. If copper bracelets helped the magnets helped, doctors would prescribe copper bracelets and magnets. Simple as that. Now, so Barry Marshall was frustrated and he was angry. And so what he did, he, he did the following. He endoscoped the patient who had an ulcer. He biopsied the ulcer and he ate the biopsy. Ate the biopsy. And in a week or two, he started having some indigestion. And his wife told him he had halitosis because he was constantly belching. Uh, then he vomited blood. And then he had himself endoscoped. And lo and behold, he had an ulcer and he had the helicobacteria germ in his stomach from the patient who he previously endoscoped. And so he did prove the cause and effect of the germ causing the ulcer. And he got the Nobel Prize, you see. Now, when we go down from the stomach, we, well, let me say something else. A glass of milk. How many of you think a glass of milk helps heartburn and helps an ulcer? Wrong. Wrong. The protein in a glass of milk is no more beneficial than a, the protein in a hamburger. Protein is protein to the stomach, and the stomach makes the same amount of acid. But it, sound, it looks better. If you drink a glass of milk, you think you, the, the ulcer will heal. Um, what I'd like to go to next is the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that just like the Mariner 9 showed that there were no canals on the surface of Mars, the Barry Marshall showed that there was no correlation between the gastric acid and the ulcer, you see. And ideas, you have to have an open mind and be able to change your thoughts about things. Uh, it, it, it's most important. Uh, another thought people have is that the stomach absorbs food. Wrong. The stomach absorbs only one thing, and that's alcohol. When a man drinks, he has in his stomach lining an enzyme. The enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase. And he can metabolize the alcohol when he drinks in his stomach. And then the metabolites are passed on to the liver. Women do not have alcohol dehydrogenase in the lining of their stomach. And so when a woman drinks, uh, she cannot metabolize the alcohol in the stomach. And so the alcohol goes directly to the liver and she gets tipsy. And so women tend to get tipsy very easily with one or two drinks. Now, you can get acclimated to alcohol and you can uh, develop a resistance to it. But when I see, a, well, let's say, men drink more than women and there are more alcoholic men than women. And men get cirrhosis from alcohol. But when I see a woman who drinks, I am more worried that she will develop cirrhosis because she does not have alcohol dehydrogenase in the lining of her stomach and she cannot metabolize the alcohol 
in her stomach. So be careful you know, if, if you drink it too much or you're a woman. Now, leaving the stomach, we enter the small intestine. And here is a picture of the small intestine. This is the guts, the small intestine. Uh, the small intestine uh, is where your nutrition is absorbed. All nutrition absorbed here in the small intestine. The only thing that the stomach absorbs besides alcohol is B12, you see. Now, there is the disease of the small intestine called uh, celiac sprue, or gluten sensitivity. In this disease, it's an autoimmune disease, and the small bowel is unable to absorb certain nutritional elements. Uh, it can't absorb calcium, it can't absorb iron, it can't absorb certain vitamins. And so the patient with celiac sprue or gluten sensitivity gets iron deficient anemia and they get pale and they get a neuropathy, they get some tingling in their hands and there's a peculiar rash that, that they develop also. Uh, the treatment for celiac sprue is to go on a gluten free diet. Now, if you do not have gluten sensitivity, there is absolutely no reason to avoid gluten in your diet. Let me say a couple of things about probiotics. Unfortunately, there is no evidence that probiotics help Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, irritable bowel, spastic colon, diverticular disease. Probiotics don't work. Probiotics work only for one disease, for certain. It's an iatrogenic disease, I-A-T-R-O-G-E-N-I-C, iatrogenic disease, and that is a disease caused by doctors. <laughs> yes, yes. When a doctor gives you a strong antibiotic and it doesn't work, and it may be because the problem was is inflammation rather than infection. Sometimes we make a mistake and we're treating inflammation, i.e. a bruise or a, 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 rather than infection, and we give antibiotics and too much antibiotics, we kill the good germs in the intestinal tract. In that case, probiotics work, and we try to repopulate the bowel. So, uh, traveling down the Grand Canal, we are now going to approach the liver. And here is the tip of the liver. The liver is in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. On the right side, there's the liver. The liver is the second largest organ of the body. Any idea what the largest organ of the body is? Yes. Skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body. Okay. Uh, the gallbladder, located here, stores bile. The liver makes the bile and stores it in the gallbladder. We get gallstones when we have an abnormal ratio of cholesterol and bile, and we form these stones in the gallbladder. If you have gallstones, there is no particular diet to help alleviate a gallbladder attack. There is no way to dissolve gallstones. And there is no diet to prevent the formation of gallstones. 
But as long as the gallstone stays in the gallbladder, no problem. But there is a problem. When the gallstone travels and it goes down into this little biliary canal here and here, and it blocks the passageway or drainage of the gallbladder. And that's when you have a gallbladder attack. And peculiarly enough, you get the pain frequently, not only in the right upper quadrant, but in the right shoulder, posteriorly, because the gallbladder isn't in the back part of the abdomen. Uh, when the stone blocks this passageway, pressure builds up and you get pain. Now, when the surgeon takes out the gallbladder, uh, patients get a problem. Some patients get a problem. And that is they may get uh, diarrhea or soft stools because the bile now is no longer being stored and it's constantly dripping into the intestine, you see. Uh, and that gives you a little loose stools. And there's a drug called Questran, cholestyramine. And uh, get your doctor to give it to you. And uh, it's a prescription. It's safe. It's cheap. It's not habit forming. Can't hurt you. But it binds the bile such that you don't have the loose stools after having your gallbladder removed. Let me talk about the pancreas. That's the yellow area right here. And the pancreas is behind the stomach. When you have pancreatitis, you get back pain, back pain, and you think it's your spine, but it's your pancreas. And that's one reason why it's so hard to make the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, because it, you would think you would have nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pain, but you get more back pain. Uh, I'd like to tell you about a teaching moment that I remember for 45 years, okay? So I was impressed by this teaching moment and I'd like to give it to you. Uh, my teacher was Dr. John Dos Santos. Dr. Dos Santos was a flamboyant Italian. He dressed impeccably and uh, he had cerebral palsy. But that didn't stop him from being a great teacher. He would flail his arm around, and you got, he had the, the jour de vie, the charisma in teaching. And he tried to stress to us the importance of careful observation, you see? And I was a first year medical student, and we were in a large auditorium, and Dr. Santos was at the podium. And we had in our hand, uh, in a little plastic clear container, our urine specimen, you see? And Dr. Santos said, now, I want you to know that the Greeks discovered diabetes in the year 200 BC. Now you say, that's impossible. I mean, how could they measure sugar? There was no way they, they knew diabetes in the year 200 BC. And he said, well, let me tell you how they did it. You see, the Greek physician would ask the men to urinate. And when they urinated in the sand, the ants would go to certain men who urinated. And they said the urine must be sweet. And so the Greek physician tasted the urine, and indeed it was sweet. And diabetes in Greek means flows like honey, you see. So Dr. Santos had his urine specimen in front of him, dipped his finger in his urine, and tasted it. And he said, voila. Well, we were first year medical students. We dipped our finger in the urine. And we tasted our urine, you see. And Dr. Santos said, remember, 
I stuck this finger in the, in the, <laughs> in the glass and I tasted this one. <laughs> Again, the, the, the importance of observation, you see. Yeah, the Greeks knew in 200 BC that the world was round. They didn't need to wait for Christopher Columbus. When they saw a ship sailing in from the Aegean on the horizon, what did you first see when you, a distant ship? You saw the top of the mast, you see. And then as the ship came closer, you saw more and more of the mast, you see. And so the ship was going over the horizon. And so they deduced that the world was round. Again, once more, the power of careful observation, you see. Well, let's get back to our gondola and we will travel further down the gastrointestinal tract. The small bowel, here's the stomach going into the small bowel. The small bowel empties into the colon. And this brings up the problem of constipation. Constipation is not a disease. It's a symptom of a problem. Just like fever is not a disease, it's a symptom of a problem. And the causes of constipation are numerous. Uh, constipation is more common as you get older. You have less peristaltic contractions moving the uh, stool through the intestinal tract. Uh, the normal frequency of a bowel movement in individuals varies uh, greatly. Uh, women have much more problems with constipation than men. Uh, in women, uh, they have a uterus, they have fallopian tubes, they have ovaries, they have a lot of things packed down, down there, you see? And this little small bowel and colon got to go around all this, you see? Uh, and the, the colon can be like an anaconda tortuous and redundant. And this adds to the problem of constipation. Uh, further, if a woman has a prolapse, either the uterus or the bladder, this adds again to the problem of constipation. Uh, other diseases makes constipation more of a problem. Uh, you, if you have uh, Parkinson's disease, hypothyroidism, diverticulosis with, with stricture, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, all these can add to the problem of constipation. So constipation, again, is not a disease, but the, a symptom of a problem. Uh, there's probably about 10 more different causes of constipation. Uh, constipation is serious when there is weight loss, when there is blood in the stool, uh, if there's a family history of colitis, uh, if there's a family history of colon cancer. Uh, but otherwise, constipation is generally uh, a simple problem but needs treatment. In my thought, the worst thing you can do for problems of constipation is to have a high fiber diet. You've got a tortuous, redundant colon that looks like an anaconda, and you're putting fiber through it, and it can't go through. So I would recommend a low fiber diet. Now, um, your mother would simply tell you that there's a simple solution, prune juice. And that's what I would recommend, prune juice. Can't hurt you, simple, healthy, but what if prune juice doesn't work, okay? And that's not the answer. Uh, then I recommend Miralax. Miralax, unlike Exlax, Exlax increases propulsion, uh, increases con and works fast, but it's not the answer, you see. Miralax draws water into the bath, and you feel like you need to move your bowels. Uh, 
it takes a day or two to work. And I would recommend you get one capful a day uh, in a, for eight ounces of water. And you try it. And give it a day or two to work. And if you find that it's working, then you reduce it to a half a capsule, a, 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 a half a capful a day. Uh, and you stop it once the problem is solved. Um, now, let me say a couple of things about irritable bowel or spastic colon. Uh, that is probably the most common problem a gastroenterologist sees in the office. There is no blood test, x-ray, CT scan, or MRI for irritable bowel. Uh, biopsies of the colon in this, with this problem are completely normal. However, if you measure the pressure in the bowel with people who have irritable bowel, you find that the pressure is high. When the patient tells you they're bloated and that their pants are tight, this is not in their head. This is not up here. This is down here, you see, and it's real. Now, stress does not cause irritable bowel, but stress will make irritable bowel much worse. Stress does not cause angina. Angina is caused by atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, but stress will make angina and heart pain worse. Now, one must be careful when we're talking about irritable bowel to make sure we're not talking about ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Uh, Crohn's disease can involve the small bowel and or the colon. And in Crohn's disease, you cannot cut it out because it's diffuse, small bowel and colon. Ulcerative colitis involves only the colon. If you take out the colon in a patient with ulcerative colitis, you've cured the disease. What happens is you take the small bowel here, the end, and you attach it to the rectum, and you've eliminated ulcerative colitis. Now, the function of the colon is twofold. The colon stores the stool, and the colon absorbs water. You can live perfectly normally without a colon. It would require that you have frequent bowel movements because you can't store the stool, and you uh, gotta be careful not to get dehydrated because I said, the colon uh, uh, absorbs water. Uh, let me talk a little bit. The stomach absorbs B12, all nutrition absorbed in the small bowel. Now, let us talk a little bit about diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Um, diverticulosis refers to uh, pouches, small pouches in the colon. Uh, approximately 80% of people have a few diverticula in their colon, and they have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, it's when the diverticula becomes inflamed it becomes diverticulitis, itis meaning inflammation, like appendicitis. But diverticulosis is generally asymptomatic. Let me tell you another thing that I did wrong. I would tell my patients not to eat nuts or seeds if they had diverticulosis. 
because the little nut or seed will get stuck in the patch. Uh, wrong, wrong. Shown in the New England Journal of Medicine that nuts and seeds do not get stuck in the pouch and do not cause diverticulitis. You can eat all the nuts and seeds you want. Uh, have a fiber diet, but no restriction as far as nuts and seeds. Uh, let me say something about colon polyps. Colon polyp. Colon polyps are common. Uh, the endoscopist does a colonoscopy on the patient, circles the polyp with a little snail, and cuts the polyp off. Uh, most polyps are completely benign, nothing to worry about. Very few polyps become cancerous. Uh, if you've had a polyp, there is no particular diet to take to prevent more polyp formation. Uh, and there's no particular diet uh, to uh, recommend in this regard. Uh, let us go now towards the end of our journey and let's talk a little bit about uh, the rectum and hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are varicose veins. Um, they involve the rectum. Only external hemorrhoids bleed. Internal hemorrhoids do not bleed. Pregnancy is a common cause of hemorrhoids. Other problems uh, causing it is constipation. Let me say a couple words about fecal impaction. <clears throat> this involves a very hard stool that you are unable to pass. If you take your right hand and you touch your rectum, you will feel on the right side of the rectum a hard mass. But that is the fecal impaction. Taking Xlax and Miralax will not get rid of the fecal impaction. What you need and what I suggest is get a Fleet's enema. Fleet's enema, you buy it over the counter and you squirt that up your rectum and that breaks up the fecal impaction. If you go to the emergency room with a fecal impaction, what happens is you're gonna get a CT scan of the abdomen and a $2,000 bill for a fecal impaction. So have a fleet cinema at home, you'd be able to use it, squirt it up, and break it up. I would recommend then, after you break up the fecal impaction, to uh, go uh, take the Miralax and go on a liquid diet for 24 hours or so. Uh, hemorrhoids, I would suggest getting uh, the uh, hemorrhoidal uh, suppository, Dip it, take your little suppository, and dip it in the old-fashioned petroleum jelly, because sometimes it's hard to insert. And put the little uh, suppository in your rectum at night, and it'll try to shrink and heal the hemorrhoids. So the best thing to treat hemorrhoids is to prevent them from getting inflamed. Use the Preparation H uh, suppositories to prevent it. Two minutes. Let me conclude my talk by saying that I have found the practice of medicine absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've uh, enjoyed it immensely, and that's why I practiced until my 70s. Some of the thoughts that I've given you today are, uh, will, 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 are incorrect, but uh, listen and learn and keep an open mind to new ideas, and I thank you for permitting me to talk today. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have a traditional time for questions from the audience, but we have about 15 minutes.
before I take him up the stairs for lunch. Um, would you want, if you want to leave, do, but otherwise just come up and ask Peter, and you might hear your question answered. So, Peter, that was very interesting. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Leave some food on your plate.